Yes, sir. It's done. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bodai. Uh, and Bodai is a senior research scientist uh, in Google Brain. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Georgia Tech, and his research interest lies in developing principled machine learning method, especially on reinforcement learning and data-driven algorithm design, as well as various applications, including recommendation systems, dialogue assistance, and data-driven science acceleration. He has published many uh, papers in top uh, machine learning conferences, and also he is the recipient of the best paper award at the uh, ASDES 2016 and uh, NIPS uh, 2017 workshop in uh, machine learning for material science. Um, um, he also served as the area chair or senior program committee in many major machine learning conferences, such as uh, HIII, ASDATS, ICLI ICML, and NeurIPS. Uh, what I is going to talk about offline reinforcement learning today. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's just welcome uh, Bodai. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Professor Song. Actually, uh, I was a PhD student working with Professor Song two years ago. Yeah, it's uh, it was a quite great uh, journey. So today uh, I will talk about my research after my PhD graduation and mainly in Google Brain. Uh, it's about offline reinforced learning from algorithm theory to applications. Uh, okay, let's start. Oops, sorry. So uh, let's first start from some uh, overview of the power of reinforcement learning. We know recently reinforcement learning have attracted more and more uh, attention in the whole machine learning community. Uh, actually, people have already formed many problems ranging from playing games like Atari games, Go and uh, 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 Shogging, and uh, up to the dialogue evaluation in chatbot and also self-driving vehicle and so on. So for so many problem in tool reinforced learning. But, uh, sorry. But uh, actually uh, we, we can only claim that we achieve success application in playing games. It's because uh, we have very good simulator in games. And also if you take a very bad move in the games, you don't uh, gain a lot of uh, serious uh, disaster or so on and so forth. But uh, this is not the case for the dialogue evaluation, sorry, dialogue generalization and the uh, self driving vehicle because we know uh, these two applications may lead to some unaffordable cost or some unexpected disaster. For example, in dialogue evaluation generalization, uh, if you use the vanilla reinforcement learning, you need to play with the chatbot with some humans. And uh, that means you need to hire at least uh, some human to play with your chatbot. So you see, this is sometimes unaffordable. And uh, also in self-driving car, you can never just uh, deploy your policy directly to the vehicle. And uh, this will lead to unexpected disaster in the, uh, which hurt both pedestrian and the driver in the car. So, Let's look at the problem. Why this happens? It's just because you cannot control the procedure of the collecting data in your uh, vanilla reinforcement learning, which is like the first row, uh, first figure in the this slides. That means the agent actually is playing directly with the environment and then use the feedback from the environment to update the agent itself. So in this case, you see uh, the agent sometimes will make very bad decisions. So it will, and when you interact with this kind of action to the environment, it may be leads to some undesirable uh, results. So what, what we can do? That's the motivation that why we propose this kind of offline reinforced learning, learning setting, which is instead of directly using your current agent or policy to interact with the environment, you have some expert or controlled behavior, uh, behavior policy to interact with the environment where you collect a lot of interaction and then you use these in collect interaction to uh, finish your task. In, we call this offline. So according to the, uh, 
ability of the agent to use the data. Actually, uh, reinforced learning is categorized into three different classes. Uh, first one is the, the vanilla one, which we call it, sorry, online reinforced learning, which is every time your current policy will interact with the environment. And according to that policy, you will collect off a lot of data. And then you only use the, this, the collected data in this tier to update your policy. And you iterate, iterate this procedure, so on and so forth. This is we call online because every time you just use the data from current policy. And on the other uh, end of the span spectrum, it's uh, offline reinforcement learning, where is there's some policy collect data for you and you don't directly interact with the environment. You only interact with the collected data to, um, to finish the task. We call it offline reinforcement learning. And there's some hybrid style where uh, you the, the policy itself can interact with the environment and you will collect a bunch of data, but you don't just use current policy collect data to update your policy. You can also use some other uh, behavior policy collect data to update your policy, so on and so forth. Uh, so today, we will only focus on the offline reinforcement learning one. So this is the clarify our setting and give the motivation why we want to do this offline reinforcement learning instead of the vanilla online setting. Okay, before we dive into the uh, detailed problem, do you have any que questions about this uh, reinforcement learning setting? Okay, if there's no question, let's move on to, okay. Let's move on to the problem. Okay, before we, pro, pro, before we introduce our technology, we first will introduce the basic model in reinforcement learning, which is called Markov descent processes. Uh, a Markov processes actually is defined as a tuple, which is denoted as using pi as the policy, which is the conditional distribution, which means give you state and you will sample action from the action space according to this policy. Uh, and then there is a transition probability, which it denotes as P, which uh, condition current state and action you choose, uh, the environment will move, switch to another state as prime. And also the reward function, which is uh, RSA. It can be deterministic and also can be a, a random function, which means I give you a state and action, it will generate a random variable R from distribution. And also here, gamma is a scalar. Uh, actually, it will, you will see why we define this gamma as a scalar between zero and one. That's because we need to define a, a policy value new pi here. It's expectation over discounted reward function. Uh, let's give a, give a illustration of how intuition, how this policy, how this policy value is defined. Okay, at the beginning, you will uh, starting from say to Z, S zero, and then you will select A zero from policy. And according to this S zero and A zero, uh, based on the transition probability, uh, sorry, based on the reward function, you will get a reward. And then based on the transition probability, you, you will move to a next step, uh, S one. And uh, uh, the MDP will uh, iterate this pr procedure uh, re repeatedly, so on and so forth. We will have a trajectory. Uh, the trajectory can be, can go to infinite many steps or that stop at some prefixed uh, horizon. So in this talk, I will just uh, talk about the infinite horizon MDP uh, for simplicity. But our technique can also be generalized to uh, per, uh, fixed horizon MDP. So based on this illustration, let's see the mu pi here actually it's just a discounted uh, cumulative reward from S zero to S infinite. And the expectation taking with respect to all the randomness from the policy and uh, transition from probability and also the reward. The reason we define a uh, gamma here 
between zero and y, just trying to make sure this expectation of the cumulative work, cumulative sum is well defined. Uh, actually, it, this is called policy value, and it is the core of uh, reinforced learning. Uh, in reinforced learning, we don't have uh, knowledge about pi, uh, sorry, p and r. Here, we only can sample from it. So that means uh, we need to. Uh, th that means when we want to get this value, it reduces to the one fundamental problem in reinforced learning called policy evaluation. And uh, after we get the policy value, there is another fundamental problem in reinforced learning, which is we select the policy, which gives you the maximum of this value, uh, which is called policy optimization. So this is two fundamental problem in reinforced learning. And uh, today we will, because of time limits, we will just uh, focus on the off policy, offline policy evaluation problem. Okay, we here give the formal definition of offline policy evaluation. Uh, actually, before let's let's go back to the slides. Uh, starting from here, when when I say I want to evaluate this policy value, so the first idea actually is straightforwardly say you can execute this policy pi on this MVP and you collect the data, uh, collect the trajectory and to use the Monte Carlo approximation for this expectation. Uh, that's one way to do the policy evaluation. But in this way, you see, we need to execute pi to interact with this policy, uh, sorry, to interact with this environments. But as, as we mentioned uh, in the offline setting, we don't have this ability to directly sample from the environment. So that's why in this offline policy evaluation, we only have collected data from some pi zero, which is known as behavior policy uh, to, to have this collected trajectory. Uh, but what we are interested in is the policy value of pi. So the goal of the offline policy evaluation is how we can get this estimation of pi, uh, mu pi according to this data set. And the data set is constructed by some pi zero, which is different from your pi. And uh, this is called policy, offline policy evaluation. Uh, sometimes we, we don't know who provides the data for you, uh, which means we don't have access to pi information to pi zero. So this setting is called uh, behavior policy agnostic uh, OPE. So let's see, uh, let's see how the people use uh, finish this task before. Uh, one of the major problem, one of the major method is called inverse propensity score, which is short as IPS. The idea actually is very simple. Uh, as, as we can see, first lies according to the definition of policy value. And then because we don't have the uh, sample from pi, but we only have sample from pi zero. So what do we do actually is just do an important sampling. And that leads to the second line here. And then third line is say, okay, once we have data, we use the Monte Carlo approximation to that. So this gives you the IPS estimator of the policy uh, value. But this estimator actually is, have some serious problem because the variance of this estimator actually is exponentially increasing uh, with respect to the horizon, which means as the horizon becomes longer and longer, you, you cannot have a good estimation for the policy value. The reason why it has the exponential uh, relationship to the horizon actually is simple. You can see we transform the uh, product term to this exponential summation formulation. And uh, under the assumption saying the ratio between this uh, target policy and pi zero is bounded. So it directly gives you that eventually this ratio is bound, uh, it's bounded by exponential h times c. So 
roughly speaking, this is the reason why this uh, IPS is not working well in practice. Uh, and in, in the literature, actually, people notice this problem, we call it curse of horizon. And uh, uh, many people actually working on reducing the variance in the OPE, I mean, IPS, pro, IPS estimator. And one of them actually is known as doubly robust estimator, which is showing, theoretically show it works, uh, it should re reduce the variance. But uh, uh, in the worst case, even the doubly robust estimators still have the uh, curse of horizon. So what do we can do? That's the first part of our talk. Uh, okay, this, the basic idea to avoid this uh, curse of horizon, actually it's very straightforward. We say, if we have a new formulation to the policy value instead of this expectation of the uh, weighted summation, it potentially gives us the way to eliminate the curse of horizon. So that's the uh, basic idea. So based on the bas that basic idea, we define this stationary uh, state action occupancy. So here, this can can you see my mouse? Okay. Here we we de define the p pi as t and a t is the marginal distribution of state and action after t step. And uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, weighted accumulation of this marginal distribution, and that is denoted as the stationary state action occupancy. And after this, after we define this notation, we can rewrite the policy value into expectation of this particular stationary distribution uh, with the reward function. So that means if we have this stationary state action occupancy uh, estimated well, we can just use Monte Carlo approximation according to the sample from this different distribution instead of the whole trajectory. So it's naturally avoid the uh, curse of horizon. So is that possible? Actually, the answer is yes. By utilizing the property of the recursion characteristic of the different distribution. Uh, believe that this stationary distribution actually uh, satisfy this uh, recursion relationship. Uh, the duration actually is not difficult. It just uh, expands the, the definition of the d pi. But let's look at what it stands for. It stands for the current station distribution is constructed by a mixture of distribution of two components. Y is one minus, one minus gamma from the initial states and the sample one more step according to the policy. And the other part is the gamma uh, ratio, a gamma uh, probability from sample from previous state and action. And uh, then you execute that state action according to the environment to get next state. And with that next state, you sample one action from your policy. So this leads this definition show, uh, this relationship show the recursion uh, structure in dpi. So with this definition, I mean, with this characteristic of dpi and also the definition of the policy value, we can rewrite the policy value into a linear programming formulation. That's right here. Uh, okay, now it seems like we have a new way to represent the policy value, but actually this way, it's not easy to solve. Why? Because the, the constraint actually is respect to every state and action pair, which means uh, if your state and action is infinite many, this pair will go to infinite many. So it's the constraint is too many to solve in this formulation. And uh, particularly in your data, in your setting, it's offline and you only have a bunch of data. So in that data, maybe some of data, some of state action is not observed. So you will still not have that constraint in your data set. So how can we deal with this kind of optimization? So idea is actually follow the standard way to 
rewrite the linear programming into Lagrangian. Okay, here it just we just rewrite the previous linear programming to its Lagrangian primal dual form. Uh, but uh, you see, recall we only have all flight data, and here expectation is with respect to the D, so it's not computable. If I only provide you the offline data, our idea is then we use important sampling here uh, to replace this expectation with respect D to respect to DD. Here DD stands for the distribution of the uh, offline data. And then we introduce the ratio tau here that's between your D and the DD. So now we can see every term in this uh, Lagrangian is approximatable by only samples from your data set so that we can use stochastic gradient to solve it. And then this uh, formulation actually is com compatible with neural, neural network parameterized the Q and the tau function. And third one actually is the property of this uh, particular estimator that is the ratio we estimated tau here is independent of this reward so that it will have some benefits for sparse reward MDP. We will sh show the benefits, benefits of this uh, from this independent in sparse MDP in our application later. Now we can see after we reformulate the problem into a optimization, actually set a point optimization, and once we solve it, we can use the ratio tau to come back to get the policy value estimation. And uh, before we get into the theoretical part, let's first do an empirical evaluation to see whether it, it indeed works or not. Uh, actually, in our paper, we conduct uh, several experiments on different environments. And here, because of time limit, I only pick one environment to show here, which is known as richer in Mojico uh, benchmark. The task here is actually the policy is control the R. And uh, the target is trying to make sure the green end in the R to reach the red point in the 2D space. Uh, we are evaluating the policy in this environment. And uh, we, 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 we construct the pi zero to collect the data. Pi zero actually is the mixture distribution, uh, where, which have one minus alpha weights from pi beta. It's totally different from your pi, and plus alpha weights from your ta pi target policy. So that when the alpha is increasing, the pi zero become more and more similar to the target policy. And the figure here actually is, you can see, we, we increase gradually alpha from zero to uh, 0 0.66. Uh, so the problem become more and more easier because the behavior policy is more and more similar to the target policy. And we compare our method, which is green, to, green line here, sorry, blue line here, with respect to uh, IPS, which is the yellow line and also to TD method, uh, which is the, the green line and uh, the orange line. Uh, the red dot line actually is the ground truth value. Actually from here, we can see our, the proposed method become quickly get the correct answer while the other estimators have huge variance and they didn't convert to the correct answers in this period. Uh, okay, here we finish the algorithm part. Uh, that's the base model from this framework. Oops. And uh, then the natural question is uh, whether this method actually can handle the cursor horizon Actually, the answer is yes. Actually, it's even better. We recently theoretical proof that under some assumption about the collecting data procedure and also the uh, some restriction on the rewards, 
we can even show that in the episodic setting with tabular MDP, the, the sample complexity is independent of the horizon, which is quite a, surprising. Uh, here is one over square root of one over mc. m is number of the uh, trajectory, and c is the quality of the collected data, which is a uh, parameter to, to, to qualify the data collection coverage. Uh, due to the space limit I, I, and also time limit, I didn't go to the detail of how to prove this result. But the idea is like uh, eventually we, we reduce the problem to uh, to quantify the high order of variance of the Markov chain, and then we we will use Friedman inequality to bound the the we will treat the whole traject, whole. Uh, Procedure as a martingale, and then we we use the freedom and inequality to bound variance term. So, and also we show that this indeed achieves the lower bound of the OP. Basically, this is saying theoretically, with this kind of method, you don't need to worry about the uh, the exponential increasing with the horizon. And we also show that this algorithm is optimal in terms of the sample complexity. Okay. Now that's the theoretical part. And uh, oops. Sorry, the my laptop just go down. Okay, come back. Uh now we, we just introduced our base method from the framework. And uh, actually we have a bunch of extension from framework, including the gen dice, which generates generalize the method from the discounted MDP to undiscounted MDP, and also coinize, which uh, not just provide your coin estimator of the policy value, but also the confidence interval of the policy value. And then we extend this method to policy optimization and the policy selection, which is uh, LG dice and also base dice. And if you have some interest and you can refer to the reference here, I've just provided. Okay, uh, now we finish the mathematical part. And next we will introduce how we apply this method to, to real application. And uh, I, I would actually thinking before that, do you have any questions in the audience about this method and also the theoretical part? That's good. Uh-huh, that looks good. Okay, then we will go to the application part, where, as I mentioned, uh, the dialogue evaluation and dialogue generation can be reformulated as policy evaluation. And uh, here I give the concrete uh, mapping from how we can reformulate the dialogue evaluation to policy evaluation. And let's first uh, take this uh, air ticket booking system as an example. So. Uh, uh, the right hand side is the uh, air ticket boot agent, and the right, left hand side is the the customer. And uh, the customer actually is interact with the agent to finish task, which is trying to find a ticket such that it satisfies the customer's requirement. So in this setting, the uh, we we define the action as the agent response. And uh, we map the state as the whole conversation history. And the reward here actually is whether the task is finished or not. And uh, also we define the transition in this particular application as how human responds to the agent. And so we, we, we actually uh, have every component in MDP uh, particularly specialized in this setting. Now let's see, uh, it seems like we, we can directly apply what we proposed DICE family to this uh, algorithm, to this application, but actually it's not that trivial. We, we tried before uh, we conclude success and it's totally failed. And we're looking to the reason, actually there's three different reasons. First one is uh, in this particular application, you see, we only get the reward once the agent helps the customer finish the air ticket booking. And otherwise it's always zero. 
So that means the reward is super sparse. Uh, this is one reason. And then the other reason is uh, in the DICE framework, what we derive is only applicable for either infinite horizon or fixed horizon MDP. And in this particular application, actually it's uh, the horizon of the conversation is varying for different instances. So this is also gives some difficulty to apply the dice. Uh, the third application, uh, sorry, third difficulty actually is the most important one, which is in to make sure the dice is successful applied, we require in the assumption saying the state, the ratio is bounded in our dice family. But here, because the state action is combinatorial large, and you only have finite sample, it's difficult to cover every state and action pair. So that means in your estimator, sometimes if you use this uh, raw data, the tall part is unbounded, which means the variance will be exploded. So that gives you, that's the three reason why this dice is not directly applicable. But uh, uh, don't worry, we, we, we introduce some technique to deal with each, each one. So first one is, as we, we noticed that dice is independent with respect, uh, dice is estimating the ratio, which is independent of the reward. So we don't need to worry about this first one too much. Only the some vanilla method like linear, uh, linear square TD method is uh, have some trouble to deal with the sparse reward MDP. And second one is uh, to deal with this varying finite horizon, we will introduce the padding scheme, which we call it pseudo state padding to ensure eventually we transform this uh, very finite horizon MDP to infinite horizon MDP. And also we can recover the original policy from this uh, modified MDP. And third one is, uh, yeah, we will use some uh, language model embedding in our function approximation to ensure uh, with high probability this is the, the unbounded, unbounded scenario is not happening. So this three component will equip but equipment with these three different components. So that will achieve eventually good results. Let's see what see it one by one. Uh, first one is how we deal with the the varying finite horizon case. So as I mentioned, we will introduce some panic scheme. So I I gave an illustration here. So the green part actually is our original. Uh, Tra trajectory generated by the original MDP. So after step T, it will finish and uh, we will have the reward function uh, reward. Uh, but uh, in this padding scheme, we, we, we are not stopping here. We say virtually we can still do a deterministic trans trans transition from ST to pad T plus one and so on so forth, eventually goes to pad T max. So this will make sure the very part will have changing to a finite horizon, which every sequence will have T max. And then after that, to make its infinite many, we just uh, say after T max, it will go back to the starting point. And, uh, sorry, and the sample from initial distribution S0 to restart this procedure and so on and so forth. So by this, uh, padding scheme, we will eventually change our MDP to infinite horizon MDP. Uh, actually, we proved that by this argumentation, this new infinite horizon has a unique stationary state action distribution. But actually, this is not that easy to prove because the vanilla ergodicity argument is no longer valid here because this MDP, actually, you can see trivially, it's periodic. So after T max, you will come back again and so on and so forth. So this is not trivial. And the second one is, second property of this padding scheme is that although the uh, policy value from this augmented MDP is not exactly the same as the, the original MDP, actually it's proportional with respect to some uh, scalar and we can uh, calculate scalar exactly so that we can recover the original policy value 
uh, from this augmented, uh, from the post value on this augmented MDP. So with these two property, we can safely apply the dice, at least the theoretically to this uh, application. And also we need to mention that uh, uh, actually in our implementation, we never in re real conduct that kind of operation. It's just a conceptually. So conceptually we have this kind of uh, augmentation, but we've never uh, executed it. So there's no actual computational cost introduced here. So that's the first part to, uh, to avoid the difficulty we mentioned before. And the second one is, as we mentioned, uh, the DICE, the application, to, to, to make sure the DICE actually is success, we need to make sure every state action have some min minimal visitation uh, probability. But uh, in this language application, the state and action actually is combinatory with respect to size of vocabulary. And especially we define the state is uh, concatenated with previous whole history. So I don't think this uh, assumption is valid anymore. Uh, so that means DICE is not directly applied, applicable here. But uh, we, 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 instead of using the raw representation, we use a uh, uh, language model embedding to first transform the state action to an embedding space. And then we use, we, we parameterize the neural network for uh, gamma and the Q in our dice to solve the problem. Uh, okay, in our experiment, actually we choose Robota, but uh, uh, I, I think other language model embedding for example, BERT and also the XL net and so on and so forth is also applicable. We didn't uh, explore that many here. So with these two components, eventually we actually apply equivalent to the dice to apply this, to apply to this uh, dialogue evaluation problem. So before we see the experiments, do we have any questions about uh, this uh, modification of the method? So, so you mentioned that the action space is, is combinatorial very large. How mm -hmm. do you do this? Uh, in the previous slide, you have uh, uh, an item about that. Yeah, actually uh, here, I didn't show the detail, but you may, as I mentioned, the philosophy is I just want to transfer the raw data into embedding space and find out this dimension embedding space. And uh, for that, to, to make that possible, we use a special desired attention model mm -hmm. to handle the variant, uh, to handle the different lengths of the historic, historic dialogue. So here you will, uh, for instance, you represent your action also in the embedded space. Um, and then once you uh, figure out what is the action, then you have some kind of decoder which can decode into combinatorial or discrete objects? Uh, okay, I, I see your, your questions now. Actually, in this application, we never do uh, uh, decoding because we, it's not necessary. We never need uh, dialogue generation. We only need some function with, to taking state and action and output a real number. Okay, some score? Uh-huh, some score. So that, that means the vector representation how would you search efficiently over this uh, space of discrete objects? Uh, so you have to try awesome. each one of the possible sentences or reply or something like this, right? In no, order. actually, uh, the idea is like, uh, let me give you some uh, high level idea answer. So as I mentioned in this slides, you see mm -hmm. the state actually is the conversation history, right? Yeah. That's right. The action is the uh, agent response, which is also a sentence. That's right. So after you do argumentation uh, for the state ag action together, it will be a whole, uh, it will be several sentence. Okay. And then we use the uh, embedding first to, ch to first change the word, to change this word to embedding first. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And then in this embedding level, we will do a attention pairwisely. Mm -hmm. 
to eventually give you some uh, to eventually give you also a latent representation of this as the A pair. Okay. And then we just do a weighted combination, weighted combination for this latent representation to eventually have this uh, Q function and uh, uh, gamma function. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Function. So, so, so I understand that, uh, for instance, uh, but uh, when you want to do argmax, right? I'm saying argmax mm -hmm. with respect to your uh, policy or value function, action value function. Oh, we, we, uh, that's a good question. As I mentioned uh, here, this is only do the policy evaluation. So there's okay. no argmax. Okay. okay. Action. So this is only for policy evaluation. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't need to worry about the action space. Yeah, what you mentioned actually is some difficulty. It's another difficulty to finish the policy optimization, but yeah. it's not there here. Okay. Yeah, this method is only here to try to figure out how we can evaluate some policy mm -hmm. right. uh, so that you can choose one from them. Okay, good. And uh, now we can, before we do real comparison between the proposed method to uh, current state of the art, we first do a ablation study to, to justify our argument about uh, uh, the dice and LSTDQ. We know, as I mentioned, uh, LSTDQ is highly depends on the reward function. So it's not applicable to handle the sparse reward. And uh, in dice, the major interest as major is uh, ratio, and that part is independent of the reward. So as we can see here, the dot line actually is the ground truth value. Uh, and uh, in the right hand side, right figure, both uh, round for dice actually converge to the ground truth. But this one, when we switch the dice to the LSTDQ method, actually it's never converged to the uh, ground truth of P, uh, pi one, pi two anymore. So let's justify the benefits of the dice compared to that LSTDQ for handling the sparse reward MDP. And second is uh, what I mentioned about the uh, using the uh, embedding representation. Actually, we, we didn't list the fail case because uh, it's totally not working if we replace this uh, pre-trained robota, robota representation. And here we want to see if we, we use the uh, fixed encoder and also the uh, fine-tuning. As, as you can see, uh, that case, the right-hand side is uh, with the method with just a, fixed the pre-trained encoder. And the, the alpha side is we also train the fine tune the representation a little bit. We can see uh, it's slightly better, but not that significant. But it still have say like uh, give you some more stable convergence behavior there. So this is the ablation study to justify the benefits of fine tuning. And now we see we apply this method to uh, dialogue evaluation for the air ticket booking task. Actually, there's four different ways to define the reward. One is uh, this, is, as I listed here, and also the method here is uh, blue and PPL. This is not with respect to the dialogue uh, dynamic evaluation anymore, but the people also use it, so we list here. And the state of the art method actually is known as self-play. I should emphasize the self play is different from alpha zero self play. This actually is just a model based policy evaluation, and you use the data to learn a transition and the reward function together. And then you execute your policy on this simulator to do the evaluation. And this Ingma is our dice uh, method. As we can see, in all tasks, our method beats the current state of the other method significantly. Uh, we also, this is for the setting where, where we evaluate all the agents. Actually, it's, I remember it's 20. And some of them are very difficult. That's where, why we select some of them and select agent here. Even that is case, you can see. 
the self play actually not working anymore, but the uh, proposed method still work well. Uh, okay, here's the another illustration of the results similar. So the y axis is the result provided by our method, and the x axis is the true reward. So the better the reward, uh, the better method is the dot is closer to this uh, to this line. So as we can see uh, from first row is the I think first row is the Inma method, which is our our method, and second one is as I mentioned, it's model based one. So we can see the proposed method is much better than the model based, especially on the difficult part you see here. The difficult agent sometimes gives you in in, in the model based one actually it's increased the variance is super large. Basically you cannot trust the results in the model based one for the difficult task here. And also here, we also apply the method to some chip chat dialogue evaluation. This is on a, a well-known benchmark. It actually have some, uh, in their original paper, they use some um, supervised learning to uh, predict the results by regression. And I think it is this line. And that why it's according to some uh, handcraft feature. And we also compared to this SP, which is cell play estimator. And we can see with full data, Ingma beat the current cell fast with significant margin. And even we just use partial data, like 50, half beta and 10% data, it still play behaving much better than the current state of that. Uh, okay, this is the result illustration. And now I think I'm, uh, I need to give a summarization of the whole talk. As I mentioned, the offline reinforcement learning actually makes the sampling pr procedure controllable, which is very important to the real application because it will avoid unexpected risk and cost. And also it will give us some sample efficiency by reusing the samples from other behavior policy. Uh, and the proposed dice actually gives you a practical offline reinforcement learning algorithm for both policy evaluation and the policy optimization. Although I didn't cover policy optimization here, but actually, as I mentioned, it's also uh, applicable and we have paper on that direction too. And uh, by, uh, by the same time, the algorithm as I'm, we proposed, uh, we also proved that a very strong theoretical guarantee for the proposed DICE method. Uh, and also, that's for the theoretical part. And also, we apply it to dialogue evaluation, achieve the state of the art results, I mean, performance uh, on the current well known benchmark. And uh, okay, any questions? And uh, thanks for the attention here. Yeah. I noticed there are some questions in the chat. Let me uh, read it. Is there a term of curse of vertical in reinforcement learning? If yes, does that mean the curse of dimension? Uh, actually, uh, uh, Bing, could you please explain a little bit about the vertical? What does that stand for? Okay, so actually, uh, when we use the reinforced learning, if the space is huge, so in that case, uh, so what's the meaning of the space is huge? So normally the dimensionality of the of the of the of the data uh, is high. Um, when we use the reinforced learning, so in that case, uh, so the the final results most uh, most of the time will create uh, decrease. So. I guess maybe there's some related, there's some relation with your term, the curve, uh, the curse of the horizontal. So I, I just, uh, this is the, my basic question. Okay, okay, uh, okay. Uh, I think I got your point. Uh, let me first uh, uh, explain a little bit about why people define the curse here. Usually in machine learning, when people refer to curse of something, 
that means uh, the sample complexity with respect to that term is go exponentially. So uh, if you just use the uh, discretization in continuous space, yes, I think there will be some curse of dimension uh, because the sample complexity will increase in terms of this dimension. And similar thing happens here. That's why people defy the curse of horizon is because uh, actually in the dominant estimator, this one, it's dominant in the whole community for almost 20 years and the people realize it's not good because the variance of this estimator is uh, increasing exponentially with the reflect horizon. That's why people define this curse of horizon. Uh, in reinforcement learning, I don't, I don't think there's a curse of vertical here. <laughs> yeah, but yes, I agree. There's do some do have some same problem as supervised learning, which is curse of dimension, which means the state and action is. Uh, I mean, it, it's also increased exponential if you just use discretization of the state and action space. Mm -hmm. I hope this gives you a, a roughly picture of what is curse of something and what's this curse of horizon here? Well, what's possible here is uh, when the state space or action space is large, then you, your probability, you know, over this action, maybe, you know, uh, spend, you know, a very large range, for instance. Yes. Right? Yes. Some action has a really small probability, some has really large which makes uh, each individual turn in the ratio very bad. So this yes. uh, even will make the individual turn bad. And now you have the additional kind of uh, uh, product of this small kind of a ratio. Yeah, that's which true. Makes it even could be something like that. That's true, that's true. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's your explanation here. And uh, the way people are doing uh, the curse of ver dimension, curse of vertical here is, uh, same as supervised learning, people you already do parameterization. Yes. You use a parametric model for the pi. Yeah. To use. Okay. And uh, for you talk about mostly the uh, the dice, uh, just one algorithm, or you have a. I see that you have a family of algorithms, gen dice, many things, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Dice is one, and then so what's the uh, relationship between all these different work. Can you say a little bit more? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, let me give you the whole history of how DICE family proposed. At the beginning, uh, we didn't, we would propose some algorithm called dual DICE. That's the algorithm we executed to get this figure. But the way we get to the dual DICE, that paper, which is published on Europe's 2019, it's very complicated. It's, it's like a twist of a lot of technique. So after that, we think it shouldn't look looks like in that way. So we realized, okay, actually it's not that difficult. If we view the algorithm derivation from linear programming, that's how I organize today's uh, explanation here about DLS. And with that understanding, we can generalize the algorithm to uh, undiscounted MDP, which published as the first one, gen dice. Uh, but this, both this dual dice and gen dice, I just give you a point estimator of the policy value. But sometimes we want a confidence interval of this scalar. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, we, we, we propose this coin dice paper, uh, trying to not just give you one particular estimation, but mm -hmm. also upper and lower bound for this quantity. Mm -hmm. That's the second paper. And both this dual as gen as coin as just for policy evaluation. Uh, as I mentioned, and also you, you notice that uh, the eventual task in policy, oh, sorry, reinforcement learning is to do policy optimization, which is saying, I want to find the best policy, mm -hmm. which achieves the maximal policy uh, value. So that's, uh, then we generalize the dice family to handle this problem, which leads to this uh, LG dice paper, stands for algorithm on uh, 
policy gradient for arbitrary trajectory. So that's how the LG get. Now later we, we realize, okay, this one performs not that well because sometimes the variance for different policies is totally different. So then we, we realize, okay, maybe we should also not just getting the gradient as a policy. I mean, not just to do one a policy optimization according to the policy value, but also according to some posterior, which in also modeling the uh, uncertainty of your uh, policy value. So that leads to this uh, base dice. Uh, this is the whole uh, path from beginning to the current stage of that family development. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. So um, besides the, the, the example you showed for the Majuko and also this mm -hmm. title, uh, do you actually also try the more systematic, you know, experiment maybe in the uh, Mojuko or these open AI gene or something like this. Yeah, yeah, we do we do have that kind of uh, experiment. Actually, there's another NeurIPS 2020 paper which is called offline uh, policy evaluation via regularized like laundry. I didn't list it here. It's also from our uh, collaboration. Uh, that was actually doing the empirical study of the uh, different variant of dice. Mm -hmm. uh, different regularization term to 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 see which one is better in terms of empirical comparison on uh, modulo. Okay. So now, I see. All right. So now, now can I say that this is dice family are the state of art uh, method for of policy offline policy evaluation and maybe optimization. Um, I don't think we have the state of the art results on optimization yet, but for mm -hmm. policy evaluation, we prove both theoretically and empirically it is the state of the art right now. But why is there a gap between you know the policy evaluation and optimization? Wouldn't you already have a very good objective function in some sense, and then the yeah, then optimize that you should get good policy? No? Yeah, that's what we thought, but actually in practice, there's so many factors affected eventually sometimes we, we realize we don't need to get that good policy estimation to give you better policy uh, gradient to find mm -hmm. policy, to find the optimum policy. So it's hard to say currently which one is better. Actually, uh, let me first in this way. In offline policy optimization, almost all the method uh, performs equally good or equally bad mm -hmm. okay. depends on the, uh, the hyperparameter tuning and a lot of uh, engineering technique. Okay, right. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any other question from the audience? So I don't know whether you have any slides for the future work or, you know, uh, after this, uh, what kind of thing can be done and, or promising. Uh, maybe you can also take the opportunity to talk a bit about it. Yeah, sure, sure. Actually, I have one slide, but uh, I didn't uh, show it here. Uh, I had it, but let me tell you the, uh, what my plan in the future, what's my plan in the future. Uh, actually, uh, as far as I know, for current moment, no matter causal inference and also because the reason I uh, mentioned causal uh, is because actually offline reinforcement learning is just a counterfactual, uh, counterfactual problem. Mm -hmm. And no matter in causal inference and also offline reinforcement learning, uh, people always talking about uh, the estimation problem. But look back to the ultimate goal, which is policy optimization or policy, you want to make a decision. Mm -hmm. But this part is actually still, as far as I know, I don't think too many people have realized this. A lot of paper in uh, causal inference and also offline IL is focused on evaluation, estimation. But uh, for decision making, it's not uh, 
uh, investigate that much. Actually, recently we have a paper, which I think which is the first one to look into the uh, well-known philosophy saying when you do the uh, decision making, you need to use the, the robust loss, which is uh, maximizing the uh, lower bound, such kind of. Okay. to make a way criteria utilizing the uh, regret analysis. And surprisingly, no matter UCB or LCB or just maximizing the expectation in terms of lower bound, I mean, worst case behavior, they all look the same. Okay. I mean, uh, exactly the same actually. And uh, we also ask, uh, we also have some theoretical understanding about uh, other property instead of the min max lower bound for this estimation. But this is only a very preliminary result we, for this area. I think in future, we still have many, many things to explore in, in this direction, which is uh, how do you make a decision instead of just doing estimation for yeah. uh -huh, in, in, in this offline setting. All right. OK, great. Um... If uh, there's no more question, then let's uh, thank Bodai again. And uh, boy, you will talk to these faculties uh, mm -hmm. uh, separately in the meeting, and there may be more questions. Yeah. Sure. If you have uh, any other question about the you know, university, things like this, you can also ask them. OK? Mm -hmm. Great. OK, great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, see you. See you. Oh, by the way, should I stay here? And uh, oh, I need to switch to a new zoo. Um, I think it's a new link. Um, Dr. Bo, I sent you a calendar invitation with a Microsoft Teams uh, link. I can send it to you right now by email. Sure, that's great. Okay. I think I'll have this link. Yeah. Thank you. See you then. Thank you. Mm -hmm.